welcome. My name is Maria Garifalakis. I am the Medical Director at Sexual and Reproductive Health Western Australia, um, formerly known as FPWA, or as most people know, used to know it as Family Planning. Um, we changed our name recently, and it's just to make sure that everybody knew that we weren't just about contraception, but that we also um, like to see clients about um, other sexual health issues, such as genital herpes, and I will be covering that in an update now. So we'll go through the learning objectives. Um, so we're hoping that you will be able to um, find the local management guidelines. Um, and also um, the important thing is that we all feel more confident in diagnosing and managing genital, genital herpes um, and also being able to feel more confident in discussing partner management with our patients. So I'm going to go through some kind of common questions that people um, have and I want you to have a look at the question and have a think about um, what the answer is. Okay, so we'll go through a few questions and I will give you the answers. The first one is, um, is genital herpes common? Yes, now it depends a little bit on what you, um, your definition of common is. This is a slide looking at um, different countries around the world that have actually done population studies looking for um, the presence of genital herpes. You might notice the ones in red are sort of general population um, figures and the ones in blue are um, studies of pregnant women. And we don't routinely test for herpes. Um, it's not a general thing that we do. Um, so you find a lot of the studies are limited to sexual health clinics or to antenatal clinics. We can see there that you know there's a little bit of difference between countries, but it's a pretty common thing. Right, next, next question. Genital herpes equals type 2 herpes simplex virus infection. Is that true or is that false? Now, there's also type 1, and in fact, we're finding more and more about new um, patients um, who, who have just diagnosed with herpes actually have type 1. Right? So we're getting up to half and even beyond that. So you don't, um, somebody who has genital herpes, it means they have herpes on their genitals. It doesn't tell you whether it's type 1 or type 2. And in fact, neonatal herpes, which is the thing that we really worry about um, with herpes, is actually pretty rare. Um, so rare that it's uh, there's an Australian paediatric surveillance unit project um, that, that monitors neonatal herpes. Um, however, it is very serious thing, so we do need to be concerned about it. But you can see that, that um, back in 2011, that seven out of 10 um, neonates who were diagnosed with herpes actually had type and that's particularly in, in young women. So the next one is, um, next question is, herpes type two infection is twice as common in women. Is that true or is that false? I think it'll be the same. Unfortunately, um, in studies from around the world, including um, a study of Australian adults, um, women are twice as likely to have antibodies against um, type two um, herpes simplex virus. So this is, um, the data on this slide is from a study done back um, in 2006 and it showed overall about 12% of Australian adults, that was 25 years or above, um, were shown to have HSV type 2 antibodies, but 16% 16 of women had it and 8% of men had it. Um, the figures are pretty similar for type 1 HSV, um, about 70 to 80% in both men and women. Okay, next question. Most people with genital herpes are aware that they have it. You no. Know, unfortunately, like most sexually transmittable infections, um, most people who have genital herpes are not aware that they have it. Okay, so I love this picture. I put this in almost every um, talk I give about um, sexually transmitted infections, showing that it's the people with symptoms that recognise symptoms are the tip of the iceberg, and that most people who have herpes do not realise they have it. So studies have shown that um, less than a third of people um, who have type 2 antibodies are aware that they um, might have been exposed to genital herpes. 20% um, um, who have antibodies definitely don't recognise any symptoms. But a lot of people who have antibodies, when you actually explain what the symptoms might be, actually then go on and say, oh yeah, actually, I just thought that I was itchy because I had a bit of thrush, I was irritated by my underpants, and in actual fact, um, when swabs are done during those symptoms, um, herpes is actually confirmed. 
A lot of people think that it's um, going to be obvious that they'll have herpes or they think that their partner should know. Um, and it's really important for us as health professionals to let people know. And in fact, most of the time, it's, um, there are no symptoms but there are very subtle and subtle in the team. Next um, question I'm going to ask is, are most people with genital herpes aware that they have it? Much like all sexually transmitted infections, um, most people who have genital herpes are not aware that they have it. Okay, so um, most people think that it's really obvious that they would know they have lots of pain, they have obvious lesions. In fact, the majority of people who um, have genital herpes um, do not know they have it, and unfortunately, those people are still at risk of passing it on to other people. So this, this iceberg picture really um, can apply to most um, STIs um, and I've used it in every single talk that I give about um, female chlamydia or um, HPV is a really typical one for human papillomavirus and it's just as true for herpes infection. So studies have shown that less than 30% of people who have antibodies against um, type 2 HSV are aware that they have it. Um, one in five people, even when you say, look, yep, we've got these antibodies against this um, infection, they say, look, I have absolutely no symptoms. But the big um, proportion of people, well, when you actually describe what the symptoms might be, like just a little bit of itching that happens through a day or two, actually going forward, they say, well, actually, no, I, I do recognise that. I, I assumed that it was from thrush or from irritation from my clothes. Um, and it always seemed to get better. Now that's the nature of herpes and um, when those people get counselled about it and asked to come in um, while they have symptoms, but often they um, swab to detect herpes will actually confirm that that has been the cause of their symptoms. All right, next question. Can you only pass on herpes if sores or blisters are present? Is that true or false? Now most people believe that the, um, you can only um, have be exposed to the herpes virus if your partner has a lesion. Now that's not the case. Okay, so majority of the time transmission actually occurs from somebody who does not have any obvious lesions. There's still virus on their skin, but it's not visible to anybody, um, and we call that asymptomatic shedding. If you're a clinician seeing somebody and clinically you think that they have genital herpes, do you need to wait for results before offering antiviral treatment? And the advice would be no. So the sooner you start um, treatment, the better for that person. So early treatment reduces the um, symptoms of lesions um, and should um, reduce shedding as well. So even though it's expected that um, you will take a swab and confirm um, the diagnosis. If you think clinically this is genital herpes, um, give somebody a prescription for treatment that day. Is screening for herpes routine? Now, it just depends a little bit on where you work. Um, but in general, um, screening is not considered routine for herpes. Okay, so this is a list of the sexually transmitted infections that would be um, recommended for screening in the civil book, so that's the WA. Um, guidelines for management of STIs. You can see that we've got chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, hepatitis B. Depending on where you are, you might um, think about screening for trichomonas, and depending on people's sexual practices, you might think about hepatitis A. And if there's a history of injecting drug use, you might include hepatitis C, but there is no herpes on that list. And the same goes for um, antenatal screening advice. So you might have seen the um, guidelines from the King Edward Memorial Hospital. Um, website for shared care that have there are a whole bunch of tests there that are recommended and herpes is not one of them. Okay, so you often have patients coming in and saying that they want to be tested for everything. Now it's really important to let them know that we can't test for everything, it's not possible um, and even if um, a test is available it may actually not be appropriate and we'll go through a little bit um, that a little bit later. But the kind of response I give in a clinic is I'm giving them the list. So today you're being tested for chlamydia, gonorrhea, syphilis, HIV, and hepatitis B. They're not being tested for the most common STIs, which are herpes and warts. They are common, but there are no recommended screening tests available. Now, how 
some sometimes they're born they want to know how long is it and does it take for lesions to appear after um, they're exposed to herpes infection so have a think about what the incubation period might be um, for herpes and this is um, some information from the ASHAM Australian Society for HIV and Medicine website um, contact tracing manual, fantastic resource. So it's usually two to 14 days after exposure, but it actually can be more than 12 months. You can never absolutely time when you might have been exposed to the herpes virus. Right? So you're diagnosed with a herpes lesion, you can't actually go back and say that's the partner or that's the episode of sex where I might have um, acquired this. Because most, um, most infections can be um, asymptomatic or have um, unrecognised symptoms and often episodes that are diagnosed are not actually um, from a recent, recent infection or the um, primary um, lesion. So contact tracing is not recommended, um, but partner notification may well be appropriate. So it's not a notifiable um, disease um, and there's no kind of advice about contact tracing, but you can definitely talk to your patients about letting partners know if you go through that. And really important thing as clinicians, um, what do herpes lesions look like? So I've got some photos coming up. So if you're watching this with other people around, you might want to clear the room because um, there's some pretty graphic photos of um, genital lesions coming up. So this is um, not a picture of what people would think of as genitals. So this is somebody with cold sores, which is herpes. Um, but um, all herpes lesions are definitely involved in sexual transmission. And this is a resource which I absolutely love for health professionals. It's from the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. Um, and if you just go to nshc.org.au, you'll find a whole bunch of really fantastic resources. Um, and one of the um, things you can click into is the making, diagnos making a diagnosis section. And you can click on genital observation and have a look at some pictures. Um, and they've called it the STI Atlas. So if you want to go direct to STI atlas.org, you can. Um, it will ask you for permission to enter. Picture of a group of vesicles on someone's buttocks. No, so someone might come in and say, look, I've got a whole bunch of blisters. This one is actually folliculitis. This is somebody who's come in with um, this oval discomfort and pruritus. You can see a few little ulcers around the parent there mainly. And it's confirmed that that was the case. And this is a woman who has erythema. She's got discharge um, a bit of pruritus as well. In fact, um, in this case, the diagnosis is candida vulvitis, but I'd still recommend that if you ever see somebody who's got um, breaks in the skin, so fissures, do take a swab and just make sure that it's um, there's no, it's actually not being caused by um, herpes. This is a pretty significant vulval ulcer. Hard to miss that one. Um, and actually, this is confirmed to be herpes. And this. Um, is an image of a woman who presented with quite significant um, discomfort. And you can see um, ulcers on both sides there. In fact, that was a reaction to nickel mod, so otherwise known by the brand name Aldara. That's the cream that is used for treatment of genital warts, as well as some other conditions. Um, it's really important to be mindful of the fact that people can um, have responses to the cream that can look similar to her. You don't need to get too worried and think, oh, it's caused a herpes outbreak. That's a pretty typical appearance of somebody's using the nickel. This is a man who's described having um, lesions and pruritus on the end of his penis. And he has balanitis, and it was proven that it was due to candida. So watch and remember that men can get brushed off. Um, the treatment's pretty similar. All right, so there's um, pictures of two men who have um, multiple um, pulses on the penis, and both of them have been diagnosed with um, herpes by PCR. It's 
very uncommon to actually see um, vesicles in the genitals. So you're more likely to see vesicles in someone with facial herpes. Um, often they're broken down into ulcers by the sort of tiny sort of genital ones. You might see vesicles as well. Now these are two different men who have um, solitary ulcers, which might be herpes, but there's another condition you really need to think about. Um, that's a bit more likely, and they both had um, Schenker's herpes, what we call um, the lesions that are associated with primary syphilis. Okay, these are two men. Maybe not so obvious clinically what's going on. Um, in fact, please always think about syphilis. Okay, so they both had secondary syphilis as the diagnosis. So I, whatever I see in the sexual health clinic, um, always think about doing syphilis serology because it's possible that um, that actually may be the cause of potential ulcers. So what are the symptoms? Just to reiterate, the patients may have absolutely no symptoms and have herpes. Okay, but um, if people do have symptoms, it would be most common to have painful or uncomfortable ulceration. It might also be um, discomfort with urinating and common to have vaginal um, or urethral discharge, particularly with the first episode. Um, the other thing that's more common in the first episode is having systemic symptoms, so that's um, fevers or um, aches and pains, although that can happen for some people with what kind of signs might you see? Send a whole bunch of pictures there. Feel free to go to STI Atlas and look at more pictures. Um, but what you might see is blistering or ulceration, and that may also be visible in the cervix or the rectum. Now, for women who have um, a herpes episode, it's pretty uncommon that you would just be on the cervix. Usually, to say um, vulval um, lesions as well. And I'd recommend if somebody has vulval lesions to avoid doing a specimen examination until they're actually um, resolved. Now about a third of um, patients will have um, tender inguinal lymph nodes. Um, if it's bilateral, it's more commonly from in the first episode. Um, if, if it's a recurrent episode, it's um, often unilateral. And remember that um, inguinal lymph nodes can be involved in other STMs as well. And usually with recurrences, it's, it's limited to um, the infected genital. Okay, so first episode you might have um, more widely scattered lesions, and usually with recurrences they're a bit smaller, a bit more limited. So um, after a primary infection, the virus establishes in the um, sensory ganglia, and for some reason that I don't understand, I'm not sure what we know in science um, thus far, but reactivation happens periodically, um, and it doesn't always produce symptoms or signs. Um, as I already mentioned, the recurrences are usually um, more limited, usually smaller, and often heal more quickly. So an initial episode might last up to three weeks. Um, usually for recurrences, it's a few days or less than a week. And the recurrences may be you know, not obviously um, ulcers, but maybe small erosions or fissures or even non-specific um, redness. And one um, paper that I found said that in the US it's estimated that only about 20% of people who present with um, symptoms of genital herpes actually receive a correct diagnosis initially. It's not surprising really, just you know, look at the standard districts. We're going to go through some cases. So the first case we've got Sophie who's 24 and she just presents to you for a routine pap smear. She had a normal one two years ago. The last period was um, last week. She's been in a relationship for six months and they're using condoms consistently. However, when you do examine her, you sort of get her in the lobotomy ready to have um, her pap smear done, you actually notice a small and um, small fissure at the perineum, and when you apply some pressure to it, it is actually tender. I will talk about what you might do. We ask her a little bit more about it, and she says that she thought it was thrush. So she's noticed she's had irritation, She's had it a few times before and she just uses some canister cream and a cool product. Okay, but have a think about what the possible differential diagnoses might be for her. So in fact, um, you need, do need to think about genital herpes lesions because they are often atypical. Um, you often misdiagnose because people think it's going to be more obvious um, and the most common misdiagnosis would be recurrent candida. And that's why the people themselves are affected as well as um, health professionals. So do remember that most first presentations are actually recurrences 
right? Um, and often they're not recently acquired. So how will you make the diagnosis? So I've got, I'm going to steal quite a bunch of information from the cervical guidelines. So if somebody has a genital sore and ulcer, it is important to take a history because you have to think about the other possible causes of genital ulcers that may not be as common in metro birth, that is. Um, and um, there are some conditions that are a bit, bit more common in um, other parts of WA. Um, so it's worth knowing where people are and where they've travelled to and um, what the risk factors are for other genital ulcer conditions there. Um, syphilis is common everywhere. And um, have a look at the ulcer and check for the rolled edge or the induration um, that's really typically associated with syphilis. But do collect um, a PCR swab. Okay, that's really important because that's going to tell you what's going on. And that's the kind of swab you use. So it's just a dry swab. Um, if you're using Pathos, it's just that orange top. Don't put it into charcoal or agar. The lab can no longer do a PCR on that. And the best test for um, Herpes PCR, uh, herpes is a PCR rather than um, culture. Okay, so do check with your own lab, but, but pretty much around um, Australia we've um, changed over to using PCR for the diagnosis of herpes in the region. So um, it's important to be mindful of the fact that the, there's going to be more shedding um, in the first few days of um, a lesion being present. So if somebody has a lesion, looks like it's healing, and you don't um, get a positive result, it doesn't necessarily exclude that as the cause. Okay, so it's worth actually um, counselling your patient about returning when um, an ulcer is new, or even thinking about offering um, swabs for them to collect um, a sample themselves when they get the next um, lesion. So um, you may be aware that it's important to um, make the diagnosis microbiologically of herpes for people to get the PBS subsidy for suppressive um, antiviral treatment. You don't need to wait for the result um, before you prescribe it or use um, Um, now, if you're worried about the possibility of donovanosis or syphilis, please um, consider take, doing tests for those. You can, as long as you take a dry swab and you put your concerns um, on the form. And in fact, I think PathQuest are happy if you're able to write genital ulcer PCR um, and put some clinical details and they'll do the right test. And of course, blood tests for syphilis are important. Um, but do remember that there's a window period, so if there's any clinical suspicion for syphilis and the initial one's negative, do consider doing it again in a few weeks. So this is just you know, confirming that um, self-collected swabs are okay. If, as I said, if people can't get to the clinic in time, they can do their own swab. There's no time limit, you know, in particular for a dry swab, um, that you can give them on the swab and then they can drop it off at their local collection point if they can't come back and see you a timely manner when they get the next episode. Ideally the first you know, sort of a few days really. I've certainly had taken swabs um, from lesions that are over a week old and still managed to get a positive result. So it's still worth um, taking the swabs, but the earlier they can come the better. Um, sometimes people consider doing serology instead. It's very tempting, um, but please think about the pitfalls of serology. Um, there's a window period for serology, and um, there can be um, false positives and false negatives that, that can be problematic. So I, serology definitely does not replace taking a PCR swab. And, and as I've, I've said many times already, um, please do support serology and think about testing for other STIs if it's appropriate. Um, so look in the cervical guidelines and other um, guidelines as to the appropriateness of using type-specific herpes serology. It is available and it can be used in some clinical scenarios. If somebody has a consistently um, negative swab result, even though they're getting recurrent genitals, is it may be useful if um, somebody then has um, positive type 2 serology, it probably is worth actually treating it, um, giving a trial of treatment, seeing if that works. And the other time when serology can be helpful is if um, there's uh, somebody knows that they that they themselves have genital herpes, but they're not sure about whether their partner does. And if they've 
their partners really well counselled about the meaning of um, uh, results and it's going to change what they do in their relationship or maybe the think about the implications of pregnancy then it could be um, useful in those scenarios but you really need to know about the pitfalls which I will go through. So what advice am I going to give um, a lady who's come in to have her routine pap smear and we've discovered a fissure in? So one thing I need to be mindful of is how confident do I feel about this possible diagnosis and I would refrain from um, prescribing any antibiotic cream to somebody with an undiagnosed genital ulcer. If it looks clinically like herpes, so you know, multiple painful shallow ulcers, then I'll definitely treat. For this lady, you know, I'd talk about the possibility that it could be a herpes infection. Um, you know, if it's been there for a few days, it may or may not actually offer a treatment that day. If she's particularly symptomatic, though, then I would consider it. And if, as, as mentioned earlier, if you're thinking about other possible STIs, um, have a talk to your friendly local um, sexual health expert. So in all cases, when somebody has, um, well, if somebody talks to you about um, sexual health, really, it's a good idea to talk about safer sex practices. But emphasize the fact that once somebody has, if you have a genital ulcer, you've lost that protective barrier against other infections. So um, it's really important not to have um, sex while you yourself have broken skin because you're going to put yourself at high risk of acquiring other infections from your partner. And um, there's a possibility that you have, have something that's infectious that you might pass on to somebody else as well. Um, talk, um, give out condoms if you can, if that's a service you can provide. Um, definitely talk about them and their role. Um, and if you're thinking that it could be syphilis or Donovan Assis, then it's really important to get um, the partner, to get partners um, tested and treated as appropriate. And for everybody, um, I'd advise them to come back to clinic in a week. And this is the kind of treatment, so if she is particularly symptomatic, um, then offer um, prescriptions for valacyclovir or acyclovir and don't worry too much about the doses, you can check the guidelines, silver book guidelines, um, please throw away your actual silver book, that's way out of date now, um, it's important to use that um, online resource that's been updated um, and is kept pretty well up to date um, as long as you use the online version. Now if it's a, um, if you know it's a recurrence um, of herpes then doses or the time that you use to treat uh, are a little bit different. So it's worth knowing where you can go um, to look at doses because you'll see several, several variations. The difference between the initial and episodic the main one for me is that suddenly you see fancyclovir. Um, and the only reason that it's um, not mentioned for initial is that it wasn't studied for that. It's not licensed for initial, the management of an initial episode. Um, acyclovir is pretty uncommonly prescribed in Australia because um, it's valacyclovir and fancyclovir are as pretty close to being um, as affordable as acyclovir. We can see that taking something five times a day is going to be pretty onerous for, for most people. So um, talk to your patient about um, the dosing schedules and they'll probably help you um, with the choice of what you're going to prescribe for them. And um, we're finding more and more that short course therapies are just as um, effective as the longer courses. So the silver book, um, I've already shown the guidance that's in the WA guidelines. If you have a look at the Melbourne guidelines um, or the national guidelines, you actually find um, the mention of short course therapies so just one, two or three days. And that's for um, recurrences. If someone has an initial episode that's symptomatic and you want to treat it, you say five to 10 days and that can um, be um, guided by whether their symptoms are actually resolving or not. So if they continue to get new symptoms, they can actually take it for longer and that should help. Now, is it ever too late to start therapy? Um, with the initial episode, um, if, as I said, if somebody's continuing to get new symptoms or if they've got severe systemic um, symptoms, you can actually um, start it at any time. Um, and certainly we know there's a benefit up to six days into an initial episode. Now with a recurrent episode, um, there's probably little benefit beyond the first three days of the lesion. Um, so starting within the first um, one or two days of onset um, would be what we would recommend people. 
they're, they're pretty safe medications though, so don't be too concerned to err on the side of treatment for people with symptoms. What about other advice? What other things can people do if they've got um, painful ulcers? So some things are pretty obvious, but it's worth mentioning to people to uh, avoid tight clothing, um, maybe put a uh, um, teaspoon of salt into like a pint um, of water that might help um, to soothe that area. Cool packs might be soothing. Um, passing urine in water, so in the shower or in, in a bath, maybe less painful. Um, there might be people that can take paracetamol or anti-inflammatory drugs. It's amazing that people think they need to put up with it. Um, do remind them that systemic stuff can be helpful. Um, for people who have particularly painful ulcers, um, it might be worth using topical lidocaine gel um, short term um, and maybe helpful to apply before somebody's going to urinate to help with recovery of that. Um, and very rarely people have um, severe episodes or neuropathic where it actually requires them to need a catheter. So that's, that's pretty unusual. Really important that they avoid sexual activity until the symptoms have gone. The Sophie swab result um, showed that she actually did have type 2 um, HSV DNA. Um, and you can see there in that result, when you ask for a herpes simplex virus um, PCR, not only will they do a type specific result for the type 1 and the type 2, but they'll also um, check for varicella zoster. So sometimes we diagnose um, shingles. Um, from a genital lesion that we thought was herpes. And so I'm going to follow her up in a week and see how she went with treatment or if she didn't have treatment, how things are going. Um, explain the diagnosis and the options for the ongoing management of herpes. So it's going to be important to know about the different types of medication strategies um, as well as talking to her about um, what to do about sex and talk discussing this with future partners, um, preventing risks of her getting new infections and reducing the risk of transmission to other people. Um, the other thing to do is you may have um, with not done a full sexual health screen at the first time um, that you saw her, so this is a really good opportunity to go through other STIs um, and as always talk, um, give her some sexual health education and prevention counselling. So what ways can you reduce the risk of transmission to your partners? Um, one important one is to avoid having um, sexual contact when symptoms are present. So if there are lesions, symptoms of lesions, don't have skin to skin contact with another person because that's going to um, definitely increase the risk of passing on to another person. However, there can be asymptomatic shedding and as I said, most of the times um, transmission um, occurs when there are no symptoms. So we'd recommend that people use um, a condom or a barrier um, consistently. So even when there are no symptoms, to, um, to you know, if you're having oral sex, um, then barriers exist for what we call dams um, and vaginal or anal sex to um, use condoms. Um, and suppressive therapy is another strategy um, that can reduce the risk of transmission to partners. Um, it doesn't eliminate it completely, but can in some studies, um, they've shown that it can reduce the transmission by about 50% by reducing the shedding. All right, um, one, of, well, one thing I really struggle with is the terms to use. Um, it's really important that people can't you know, feel, um, put in context what the herpes diagnosis means to them. So you're going to talk to her about the fact that um, she may well have recurrences of um, genital lesions. In fact, this may be a recurrence for Sophie. Um, and I, I think it's really important not to use really um, quite negative terms like attacks and outbreaks. Um, so you see it a lot in the literature about herpes, um, but I, I don't think it's very nice to, to call it an attack. And have a think about what term you, you might use. I much prefer um, recurrences or episodes as a term to, to describe the um, actual lesions. Um, really important to, um, for people to understand the asymptomatic shedding and I'll go into a little bit more detail with people about it. So in, in explain to them that it's quite likely that um, that may be how they actually um, came into contact with it in the first place. Um, also let them know that shedding gets less and less with time in most people. So it's most likely in the first 12 months. It could, it, there, 
still is a risk beyond that, but it should get less and less of the time. It is more likely if they um, get symptomatic recurrences that they're going to have shedding. Um, and that the difference between type 2 and type 1, if you have genital type 2 um, herpes virus, it's more likely that you're going to have um, recurrences and shedding because it tends to kind of like that area for one of a better term versus whether you have, um, if you have type 1 around your mouth, then you're more likely to have recurrences there. But as I said earlier, you can get um, have genital herpes that's actually caused by type 1. Um, and the shedding, as, as I mentioned earlier, can be reduced with um, more therapies a day. Okay, we've got another case of Anna. She's a 20-year-old and she presents with a two-day history of painful vulvar lesions and vaginal discharge. Um, she's in a steady relationship with a boyfriend of six months and she's using condoms consistently. This is what we see on examination. She's got um, numerous very tender vulval ulcers um, on yeah, both sides. And you take a swab and it confirms that she actually has type 1 detected. So what does that mean? Is there a difference in management? Are there differences between type 1 and 2? I've already mentioned that she's less likely to have shedding, less likely to have recurrences. But there are kind of other different implications as well. It's still called genital herpes because it's on the genitals. Um, but she might want to know that it could have been from oral sex. So it's much more likely that it could have been um, from because her partner had had a history of cold sores that actually may not have been recognised. Um, and that she needs, that she can know that the is less likely that she'll have recurrences than if she had type 2. So it's four to five um, fold less likely if it's type 1 on the genitals. Um, the transmission is slightly less likely to future partners, not eliminated though, but if a, a future partner has already been exposed to type 1 um, HSV, then they're not going to get it again. So if they've got a history of pulses, they're not going to get um, type 1 genital herpes. Now there's no good news for the risk of transmission to a newborn. In fact, you know, as we mentioned earlier, type 1 seems to be a bigger problem. Um, serology really is not terribly useful for, for type 1 because a lot of people do have had contact because um, they've had history of oral herpes or cold sores. Should I tell new partners that I have herpes? So, important question to be able to answer. Now, one study shows the benefit of telling partners. So this was done um, back in 2006, and they had people who knew that they had type 2 HSV. Um, and for those people who let their partners know, the time for their partner to then become um, positive for type 2 was 270 days versus 60 days in those people who didn't let their partner know. So there's a longer time before transmission occurred in that study um, and they overall they said that the risk of transmission was halved when the source partner knew their status and informed their partner. Now the, really critically the authors said that the changes in sexual behaviour that accompanied the disclosure which protected against HSV2 transmission were not clear so you can't really infer anything in particular about that but just letting the um, letting partners know Seem to be um, give some protection against um, transmission, as you can see, not complete protection. So, when should I tell a new partner? I think this is important to go through if you can in a clinical scenario. Just let people kind of have a think about how they might want to be informed. So, this is I've stolen these options from um, a by an amazing nurse who works in the US who's become bit of a guru um, for herpes and um, if you if you can um, get access to her books they're a great read Ter Terry Warren's her name so she's got you know in a bar at happy hour in bed as one of you slipping on a condom or on your patio having dessert okay so first two options not too appealing um, number two is a really absolutely terrible time to let somebody know but if you, you know, on your patio having dessert, you're thinking, you know, things are going to lead somewhere, um, but you're not in the heat of the moment, so that really is the best time to let someone know. And how do you tell them? So this is, um, yeah, there you go. So to, there's um, one of the books that she's published called Good News About the Bad News. In fact, 
um, she has a website um, called Westover Heights. Um, so if you Google her, Google her name, Google the good news about the bad news, you might go to her um, website and she's actually got the updated herpes handbook available as a free download. So this is an example of how you might let someone know. Um, before we have sex, there's something very personal I'd like to share with you. I've had genital herpes for about four years now. It's not a big deal for me, but I feel it's fair to let you know up front. Okay, just be honest and open about it. But yeah, you can I understand that you know someone may not want to tell somebody immediately the very first time you meet them, and it's something that um, would be good to talk with your patients, you know, just so that they can go through in their own mind how they might want to perhaps think about how they might have wanted to be told themselves if their partner had known, um, and that can give them an idea of how they might want to work in the future with partner as well. All right, so I've got another case. I've got Jane who's 30, she's been married for five years, and her husband's been recently diagnosed with genital herpes type 2 infection, and she's never had any symptoms, and she comes in to see you because she's like, oh, hang on, what was going on here? This thing has been in place. So just a reminder for that incubation period, okay? So it does, you cannot time the, um, when the original transmission has had occurred for herpes infection. So just go, we'll go through again the ways to reduce um, transmission. So we know that condoms do provide some protection, not 100% because it is a skin to skin contact thing and condoms only cover what they cover, um, but they've shown that there's a 50% reduction um, in those who use them most of the time. We can see there that that means 25 to 60% of the time in, in the studies that have been done. And that protective effect appears to be greater for women, which makes sense if you think about how, you know, sort of the anatomy of sex. Um, suppressive therapy is another way you can reduce that risk. So any of them seem to be equally good at um, suppressive shedding um, by about 89 to 90%. And as I said earlier, that um, translate to about a 50% reduction in the risk of transmission of HSV to partners. Now, on to screening for herpes um, simplex virus. So how do we screen for it? What are the pros and cons? I already mentioned earlier that it's not recommended that we do them. It's not on national guidelines, not on local guidelines, not on international guidelines. But you will find that some people do think it's a really good idea to, to screen people for herpes. How do we do it? So this is the kind of thing um, test you might do. You might do um, herpes simplex serology and ask for type specific serology. Okay, it's really important. Um, and this is the kind of result you might find. So type one IgG is negative, type two IgG is positive. So remember that window period, at least six weeks for IgG to become detected. So this is the result you have. So you've got someone who asked to be tested for everything. You included that type specific herpes serology and you've got this in front of you and you've got the patient in front of you. So just have a think about what that implications are for that person. And they're, they're, they fall, will fall into one of the three groups that I've already mentioned. So you've got people who've already been diagnosed, you've got people who have unrecognised symptoms and the counsellor didn't actually do recognise them and can be confirmed with a um, PCR, and you've got people who have no symptoms. Okay. So, do remember that serology doesn't tell you where, okay, it just tells you there are antibodies and it doesn't tell you exactly where on somebody's body it is and it doesn't necessarily confirm that that's the cause of their symptoms either. The PCR is always going to be um, more helpful in the diagnosis. Now this, I've just got a couple of slides showing the, what you'll actually see as the wording on the report. So this is somebody who had um, screening for everything and including that type specific and has positive type 1 and negative type 2. But what I want you to have a look at is that bold bit where it says how about 5 to 8 percent of results are false positives. So it's a significant false positive rate. Now this person probably has had um, past or recent type 1 infection that could be corpus or it could be genital herpes as we know. Um, but there's actually a chance that that type 2 being negative is actually false negative, or, um, and that the, the um, type 1 could be a false positive. Okay, so the next um, slide is of somebody who's got type 2 being positive um, and the type 1 being negative. 
got this rather bolded bit. So just talking about um, false positives again, so up to 4% of the false are false positives. And you need to put in context with um, everything else that's going on with that patient with the gut symptoms and what the risk factors are. Um, but know that this, these are not highly accurate tests. And one of the main reasons why I'm not really comfortable doing um, type specific herpes um, serology in people who have no symptoms. Okay, so the current advice is that um, they should only be used when they'll give clinical um, information that's going to affect their management and it's not recommended that you screen people who are asymptomatic because they don't actually give you a proper microbiological diagnosis and in fact in a low prevalence population and 12% is reasonably low prevalence in, in this respect the positive predictive value is lower um, and there are no evidence-based interventions for people who have no symptoms so there's nothing in particular that you know there's no particular advice you could give them on top of the normal advice you give about safe effects and common use. Um, and, and also if they have in, ever have breaks in the skin to come and see, make sure they don't have sexual contact until that skin is healed. And we do know that people who have genital ulcer disease, including herpes, are more likely to acquire HIV, um, but no one's ever shown that letting people know that they've got um, serology showing HSV actually has um, reduced that risk for them. All right, so we've got, um, I think this is the final case. This is Thomas, who's um, 27. He was diagnosed with genital herpes um, type 2 six months ago, and he's been having symptoms every one or two months. In a new relationship, and he's actually finding that he's having some relationship difficulties because he's avoiding sex during um, those episodes. So um, he really luckily has a copy of his um, result, which is fantastic. So the previous doctor said, look, this is going to be important for your next doctors. Um, so we've kept a copy of it um, and um, we know that this is helpful when you want to use um, PBS to subsidise um, the medication used to treat herpes. So you can see that he had the type 2 detected and there are two options for him. So we talk about um, suppressive therapy or episodic therapy and they're pros and cons of both. So episodic therapy, you wait until you get symptoms um, and then you take the antiviral medication for a few days. Now, this is really useful for people who have um, a warning time, so what we call the prodrome. So people might experience tingling, burning, a bit of itching, even sciatic pain, um, a few hours or even up to two days before um, the lesions appear. This happens um, for about half of patients with genital herpes. So episodic therapy could be really useful for them because if they start it as soon as they get the symptoms, actually might stop the lesion from even developing. But you might consider suppressive therapy, which is actually taking antiviral treatment every day, um, not necessarily the rest of your life, um, but certainly for at least six months. And that would, that's really useful for people who have um, frequent symptoms. So Thomas would be um, in that category. Um, having six episodes a year would be considered um, frequent. Um, if somebody has um, other systemic symptoms or other symptoms which are severe, um, if somebody's in the late stage of pregnancy, then um, one of the options for pregnant women to reduce the um, transmission to okay, their newborn is to take suppressive treatment. Um, if someone's in a new relationship, um, then they might consider it's appropriate to reduce that risk of transmission to a new partner until they've sort of been together for a while and had a really good talk about the pros and cons of um, um, suppressive treatment or not. If someone's had um, type 2 detected rather than type 1, would be more likely to recommend it because of that um, increased chance that they'll have more frequent recurrences. And if it's a recent infection, so the, it tends to the course tends to improve with time. It's usually in the first few years that um, people have this more severe and more frequent um, episode. Um, what are some other reasons? Somebody might decide to do it because there's, um, they want to absolutely avoid having an episode while they're on the honeymoon, for example. Um, people who are really devastated by the symptoms, it's a really good idea for them to avoid the symptoms completely, even if they've been um, very minor. Um, 
somebody has concurrent conditions, it can be really difficult to know whether the pruritus um, or lesions are actually from a recurrent candida or something like Parkinson's scoliosis. So it's worth suppressing the um, herpesitis for those people to, to see if there's a difference. Um, and if someone has very little um, warning, if they just wake up and there's a lesion, then the, the episodic treatment is not going to be terribly effective for them. It might reduce their symptoms maybe for half of the day. Um, and if someone has HIV infection, it may be a good idea to consider suppressive therapy. And for people with immunosuppression, you might actually need to um, double the dose um, of suppression. The downsides of suppression are having to remember to do something every day and the costs involved. It's um, important to talk about it with your patients, you know, the pros and cons, and that they can actually change their minds and, um, you know, depending on the situation where they're at, they might choose to um, use suppressive or episodic therapy. And there's, there's just a list of the, the three medications that you can use and um, their dosing and their schedules. So valacyclovir is once a day, pancyclovir twice a day, and acyclovir is three times a day. And there is no evidence that vitamins or zinc supplements or lysine, the big one um, that you find at health food stores, nothing's ever been shown that they um, particularly reduce um, recurrences over placebo. And topical antivirals are really easy to get over the counter or price line. Um, they are unfortunately not as effective as oral antivirals, but you'd be pleased to know you can actually get over the counter um, and cycle view for the treatment of cultures without having a prescription. Now, if someone's been on suppressive therapy, um, like, as I said, it's not necessarily something they have to take for life. Um, if they need to take it for years, that's okay. We've had people taking antivirals for decades and have had no um, negative sequelae, so it doesn't seem to change the course of the infection. It doesn't mean that when they stop it that they're any more likely to get ongoing recurrences versus someone who never took treatment. Um, but if someone has um, been taking it for six or 12 months and decides they want to stop it to see how they're going to go with recurrences, if they just get one single episode after stopping, don't panic. Um, it's pretty common for that to happen. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be an ongoing issue um, and it's not a sign just after one episode to recommence therapy. Now, neonatal herpes, the thing um, that people really worry about, as I've mentioned a couple of times, um, as I said, it's pretty a pretty rare condition. If it does happen, most of the time it's going to be at the time um, of birth. Very few and neonatal herpes infections are true intrauterine infections. It can also be from postnatal contact as well, um, so it's important to remember. Um, most of the cases of neonatal herpes are acquired from women who had no idea that they had um, herpes at all and had no symptoms. And the highest risk for transmission to a newborn is if the, the first infection occurs um, during the pregnancy, particularly in the third trimester. So if, it's, um, if there's not enough time for a woman to um, mount an antibody response, then there isn't going to be enough time for that IgG to cross the placenta and protect the newborn. So the worst time to get herpes infection is in the third trimester. Um, and somebody with a primary episode, it would be so, um, 34 weeks or later. Most of the time, they'll be recommended um, to have a cesarean section. Um, and you can see the guidelines, King Edward guidelines online. And not only the King Edward guidelines, but there's a recent publication with an update of the management of perinatal infections um, by Ranskov. And that has really good algorithms, what to do, a risk assessment for pregnant women, and also what to do if somebody's got, um, if you suspect they've got um, genital herpes or if they've got a history of genital herpes. And also how to manage a newborn um, if you recognise that the mother has genital herpes. Now, really, um, a really exciting update um, is the release of the Australian STI Management Guidelines. So that's at sti.guidelines.org.au. Um, yeah, they're actually inspired by the WA Silverbook. So the Silverbook was seen as being such a fantastic practical resource um, for practitioners in WA. The rest of Australia said, hey, we should have something like this as well. So if you go click onto um, that website, you can see that you can look at a particular STI, or you can look at syndromes, you might have some more genital ulcers, click onto the genital ulcer section, um, and also they've got um, population um, groups as well where there might be slight differences in what, how you might manage somebody. 
very practical. This is just an example. If you click onto herpes and then click onto management, it's got the nice brief quick, what do I do? What do I prescribe for someone who's got an initial episode? What do I prescribe if they've got a recurrence? Um, and a few sort of um, guidelines about what to do um, with the situation without having to trawl through um, lots of papers looking at the pros and cons of things. You want something simple and you've got something in front of you. Now, sadly, there is no vaccine available for the prevention or the treatment of genital herpes, but believe me, trials are definitely ongoing and um, you know, we, we hope that they will be available in our lifetime because, as you can see, most people are asymptomatic, there's no good screening, um, it's, it's going to continue to be a, um, a common infection until we get vaccine. So there's just a list of um, a few of the resources I used um, at the bottom there. Um, I haven't actually gone through those um, before in this talk. We've got really great resources for patients who've been recently diagnosed. So the Australian Herpes Management Forum um, and a really fantastic New Zealand one um, as well. So when you've um, made a diagnosis to somebody or if you suspect it clinically, get them to have a look at those good resources because there's a lot of uh, a lot of myths out there and lots of misinformation about herpes and make sure you guide people to, to the accurate stuff. And um, we get a lot of phone calls um, at Sexual and Reproductive Health WA um, with respect to herpes or concerns about herpes from health professionals and from um, the public. And that's great. That's what we love doing. So um, you can give people the resources for the Sexual Health Helpline. Um, the nurses can answer emails um, when they get uh, during their shift, so people can email any time if they want to phone, phone between 10 and 4, Monday to Friday, and we've got a um, country line as well. All right, and that's it. So if you could please complete and send back um, the feedback forms, and if you're a GP wanting to get RACGP points um, for this activity, please email Dr Alison Cray. She's our medical educator at SRHWA, and her details are on the feedback form. Thank you very much.